Alcoholics Anonymous was founded in 1935 by Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith in Akron, Ohio, with the stated purpose of helping alcoholics to achieve sobriety and to stay sober. To do so, they created a 12-step program that involves, among other things, admitting that alcoholism is a compulsion, that a higher power can give a person strength, that past errors can be revisited and amends can be made for those errors, that you can establish new behaviors and build yourself a new life, and that you can help others accomplish the same. Alongside those 12 steps are 12 traditions meant to help AA groups govern themselves and resolve conflicts. Among these traditions is that the only membership requirement is the desire to stop drinking, that each group should be autonomous and self-sustaining, that the AA should remain separate from other movements and enterprises and should not enter into public controversy, that the group's public relations efforts should be based on attracting people who need it rather than promoting the group or its ideology, and that there is only one ultimate authority, namely a loving God with a capital G. The group accepted its first non-Protestant member, a Roman Catholic, in 1939. An African-American from Virginia established the first black AA group in Washington, D.C. in 1945, and the first female AA member was accepted in 1947. As of 2016, there are around 2 million people across many cultures and creeds around the world who are members of the AA. Traditionally, Alcoholics Anonymous has avoided getting into the weeds about the science of alcoholism, but beginning in 1973, there were smatterings of AA-approved literature that referred to alcoholism as a disease. Among these references includes an excerpt from the book Alcoholics Anonymous, the story of how more than 100 men have recovered from alcoholism, which is often simply referred to as the big book within AA circles. And this excerpt says that alcoholism is an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. I should mention that the AA model itself, with all its steps and traditions, has been called into question many, many times. And though there is data that indicates this group's processes sometimes work, there is also a great deal of data that indicates that this method does not, at least not any more than any other method, and that the AA model is probably pseudoscience despite their claims. Now, even if this latter case is true, that doesn't mean that the program does not work for everyone, but rather that when it works, it may be because of any number of variables associated with a change in lifestyle and the support of a community, rather than being the result of the famous 12 steps. Anecdote certainly indicates that the group has been a wonderful influence for many, but scientifically there's not much substance there. That said, representatives from the group do seem to be open to new information as it becomes available, and I get the impression their past designations of alcoholism as a disease was more them using the word as a moral analogy than making a scientific claim. For a time, a few decades ago, an introduction to the big book indicated that alcoholism was a kind of allergy for some people, who as a result responded to its influences differently than other people, but they later amended this statement in a booklet called Living Sober, in which they said, quote, We AAs have never called alcoholism a disease because, technically speaking, it is not a disease entity. For example, there is no such thing as heart disease. Instead, there are many separate heart ailments, or combinations of them. It is something like that with alcoholism. Therefore, we did not wish to get in wrong with the medical profession by pronouncing alcoholism a disease entity. Hence, we have always called it an illness or a malady, a far safer term for us to use." End quote. The AA's official stance on the matter notwithstanding, 
Many people believe that alcoholism, alongside other addictions that can negatively influence a person's life on multiple levels, is a disease rather than a disorder or a choice. The disease theory of alcoholism got its first official recognition from the American Medical Association in 1956, when the group declared alcoholism to be an illness. In 1991, the AMA augmented that statement by dual classifying alcoholism as both a medical disease and a psychiatric ailment. A slew of new data emerged in this field of study in the early 2000s as genetic tests became more widely available and cheap, and new studies were conducted on twins and on the offspring of alcoholics raised by their genetic parents and those raised by adopted parents, and on mice bred to prefer alcohol. The results of these studies have been mixed, but the shared conclusion seems to be that it's complicated. There do seem to be genetic components of alcoholism, but they differ between alcoholics. Some people seem to be predisposed based on differently tuned reward systems in their brains, causing them to get more pleasure from chemicals like those contained in alcohol than most people, while for others the pleasure centers are activated by the repetition of habits. And still others may have neither of these predispositions, but their upbringing exposes them to cultural norms that revolve around heavy drinking or coping mechanisms that encourage the same. Like just about everything in the world of genetics, the current consensus is that what we call alcoholism is probably a whole lot of different things that look the same because we simplify them to fit under a single label. And the catalysts of the habits that put people in bad situations, addiction-wise, can be wildly different, even if the consequences can seem nearly identical from the outside. And this is what I want to talk about today. Not alcoholism, or even addiction specifically, but the disorders, or presumed disorders, behind antisocial behaviors, and how we perceive these disorders and punish the people who have them. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is brought to you by its wonderful listeners. If you are enjoying the show, consider helping to support it. Consider contributing to it in some way, shape, or form. There are many different ways to do this, a full list of which can be found if you go to letsknowthings.com and click on the Contribute page. Among them is leaving a review on iTunes, sharing the show with a friend or your social network of choice, or going to the Patreon page for Let's Know Things and becoming a patron. You can find that page at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. It's a really easy way to become a monthly contributor and to get some added bonuses as a result of that contribution, including an ad-free version of the show. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors. The first sponsor today is Everlane, my favorite clothing company. If you go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, it'll take you to their page and you can check out their wonderful collection of minimalist, well-structured, goes-with-everything clothing. But they will also pay out a commission for every sale that they make through that link to me. So it's a great way to perhaps fill in a gap in your wardrobe while also helping to support this podcast. That's letsnotethings.com slash Everlane. And the other sponsor today is Linda. If you go to letsnotethings.com slash Linda, that's L-Y-N-D-A, you'll receive a free 30-day trial of Linda. And Linda is a massive collection of online tutorials for all kinds of things, different skills you might want to learn, different software you might want to learn. I've used it many different times over the years for many different skills and pieces of professional software. I highly recommend it. If you are looking for something like that, letsnotethings.com slash Linda. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I want to unspool today comes from the Brookings Institute, and it's entitled New Evidence That Lead Exposure Increases Crime. This is a storyline that I've been paying attention to for a little while now ever since I read a piece a few years ago about how removing lead from petroleum for cars 
seemed to correlate with the massive decrease in crime in the 90s in the United States. There are multiple theories about this drop in crime, and it's important to note that, of course, correlation is not causation. There seems to be a connection because of how the numbers line up, but that does not mean that we know for certain that these two data points are in any way related. But what the numbers do seem to imply, if we do choose to assume that there is a connection, is that as a result of a steady phase-out of lead in gasoline within the United States, starting in 1976, and almost completely eliminating lead from gas by 1986, fewer people were exposed to lead in their environment, and therefore fewer people were victims of lead toxicity, which has been shown to have numerous effects on the human body, very much including the brain. This effect on the body is far more intense in children, whose bodies and brains are still growing, than in adults. And if you look at the kids who were born during that time period, post-lead reduction, you see a generation of kids who had significantly less lead in their systems, and significantly fewer negative consequences as a result of lead toxicity. Flash forward about a decade, and data shows a somewhat astounding drop in crime within the United States. Numbers that had been ticking steadily upward since World War II, and which peaked in the 1970s through the 1990s, began to drop precipitously in 1991. From an Atlantic piece on the topic from 2016, entitled What Caused the Great Crime Decline of the U.S., quote, By decade's end, the homicide rate plunged 42% nationwide. Violent crime decreased by one-third. What turned into a precipitous decline started later in some areas and took longer in others. But it happened everywhere, in each region of the country, in cities large and small, in rural and urban areas alike, in the Northeast, which reaped the largest benefits. The homicide rate was halved. Murders plummeted by 75% in New York City alone, as the city entered the new millennium. The trend kept ticking downward from there, more slowly and with some fluctuations to the present day. By virtually any metric, Americans now live in one of the least violent times in the nation's history. End quote. Numerous theories have been posited for this decrease, ranging from the increase in police officers that were hired starting in the 90s, to the increase in imprisonment numbers around that time, to the decline in the crack cocaine market, to an overall and steady increase in income for Americans. It could be that the crime numbers have decreased because of the changing age demographics of the country, which began to be more heavily weighted toward the older side of the scale in the 90s as the baby boomer generation started to hit middle age. Or it could be, as some claim, that the legalization of abortion reduced the number of children born to mothers in incredibly difficult circumstances, which in turn resulted in incredibly difficult childhoods for these kids, environmentally priming them for lives of struggle and becoming social outsiders. So there was a lot less of that happening because of the legalization of abortion. There are a lot of interesting possible rationales for this drop, and there are data that seem to indicate each of them could be the cause and other data that shows each of them could be complete hokum. It's likely that, like with genetics, the answer is somewhere in the middle, and the confluence of these factors, and likely many others that we haven't noticed, led to the decrease in crime in the U.S. starting in the 1990s. But the so-called lead crime hypothesis, that the reduction in lead in gasoline led to a reduction in crime, is increasingly compelling as we pull in more data, not just about crime, but also about the effects of lead on the human body and brain, and the variability of the human mind, including, importantly, the role that elements like lead play in the appearance of variations in the human mind, and how some of these variations can result in a higher propensity toward illegal antisocial behavior. Let's talk for a moment about what lead is and what it does to the exposed human body. When we talk about lead in gasoline, what we're really talking about is tetraethyl lead, which is often abbreviated as TEL. TEL is an 
organolead compound, meaning it's a substance that contains a chemical bond between carbon and the lead. In the case of TEL, the formula is open bracket CH3 CH2 close bracket 4PB. That first part designating the ethyl compound made up of carbon and hydrogen bonded together, and the latter PB representing lead. TEL was mixed with gasoline from the 1920s onward to boost the octane rating, meaning it would allow for greater engine compression and in turn increased performance or fuel economy. Less fuel for the same amount of mileage or more power for the same amount of fuel. Notably, ethanol, which is an alcohol often mixed with fuel in the US today for the same reasons that TEL was used back then, was available back then too, but it was bypassed in favor of TEL because the patent holders for TEL stood to make a fortune if their substance was used in most fuel sold in the US, and they had no small amount of influence with the oil industry, which itself was already a little bit hostile toward ethanol, which it saw as a potential competitor. Different types of leads have been used in paints and pipes and metal siding and numerous other products over the years, and for many different reasons. TEL helped improve the potency of fuel, but other types of lead used in paint allowed for the creation of new colors like chrome yellow. Lead in paint also sped up the drying process, increased the durability of the paint, and added a resistance to moisture that could otherwise lead to corrosion of the painted surface. Lead pipes have been in use since the time of the Roman Empire, though the use of lead for this purpose in the United States declined sharply after World War II as an increased awareness of the dangers of lead poisoning caused builders to be more cautious with the materials they were utilizing, which meant they generally opted for copper instead. But interestingly, lead was so inextricably connected to the idea of pipes back in Rome that the Latin word for lead, plumbum, eventually became plumbing, a system of pipes. Unfortunately, there are still many lead-based piping systems in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world, and even systems that were swapped out or which were built from some other material post-World War II, still made use of a lead-tin alloy for soldering, meaning the pipes might be made of copper, but the material joining them together is partially lead. Additionally, although lead paint was banned in the U.S. in 1978, many older homes still contain traces of it, and in many places around the world, especially those where business regulations are not so strict as in the U.S., lead paint is still produced and sold without legal consequence. The main reason lead, of all kinds, has been banned or severely restricted for so many purposes is because of the harmful effects it has on humans. Lead accumulates in the body over time, which amplifies these effects, and the neurotoxic consequences of exposure, even at very low levels, can have catastrophic consequences for the nervous system of the person exposed. These effects were noted even back in the 1920s, when the compound was first being added to gasoline. There were a few leak-related accidents at TEL refineries, which caused the death of 17 workers, along with a great many serious casualties. But regulations and public opinion being what they were back then, nothing was done as a result of these accidents. The New York Times published an editorial at the time, back in 1924, saying that the deaths of these workers should not interfere with the production of a more powerful fuel. So, priorities, I guess. Many more studies and accidents happened over the next several decades, and a low-level suspicion emerged that this was a substance that was quite possibly very bad for us, and in more ways than we already suspected. But studies, many of which were funded by the companies producing or using TEL, were inconclusive. This changed in an interesting way when geochemist Claire Cameron Patterson accidentally discovered how much and what kind of pollution was being generated by TEL-laced gasoline. Patterson was doing research in an attempt to determine the age of the Earth, which required that he measure the lead content of very old rocks, while also measuring the amount of time it took uranium, which occurred naturally, to decay into lead. This was a process called radiometric dating. He came to realize while doing this research that the large quantity of lead in the environment, most of it unnatural, was messing with his measurements, and he had to work in a clean room to get anything close to accurate numbers. 
After finishing up his research, which resulted in a fairly accurate measurement for the age of the planet, 4.55 billion years, which is still pretty close to contemporary estimates, arrived at using more modern tools and techniques, Patterson turned his attention back to the lead in the environment which had screwed with his readings. He was able to trace the contamination back to when TEL became widely used in gasoline, and in 1965 he published a paper entitled Contaminated and Natural Lead Environments of Man, in which he paid particular attention to the problems caused in natural food chains by the lead produced and disseminated by human industry, very much including gasoline. History would eventually prove Patterson right on this point, but at that time he was ridiculed and outcast due to this stance. The Ethel Corporation, which produced TEL and employed numerous environmental scientists, including a particularly well-known and powerful toxicologist named Robert Kehoe, kept Patterson from being published and from speaking about his findings, and even excluded him from the National Research Council panel on atmospheric lead contamination, a subject that he was the foremost expert on, but which was heavily influenced by the economic forces underpinning the continued use of lead in gasoline. It was later these same economic forces that would cause TEL to fall out of favor in the automotive industry. It came to light that although TEL made fuel more effective, it also had a hugely deleterious effect on catalytic converters, which were required in all new cars around that time due to the Environmental Protection Agency's desire to crack down on pollutants that resulted from automotive emissions. As the influential powers that had rallied against him began to weaken, Patterson's studies were viewed in a new light, and they helped increase the rapidity at which lead was removed from fuel and other industrial processes over the next decade. It's estimated that from the 1970s to the 1990s, the blood lead levels in both children and adults in the U.S. dropped more than 80% as a result of these measures. What's happened in the years since has been, more or less, an increase in the resolution at which we were able to view this issue previously. We began to phase out lead in just about every product and piece of infrastructure a person might come into contact with in the mid-70s, and that process was more or less complete in most of the developed world, including the U.S., by the year 2000. What we've learned since is just how subtle and varied the impacts of lead exposure can be, especially in children. Even the tiniest exposure within a community can lead to measurable decreases in IQ in that population. And over the past decade, at least three major studies have indicated that it's possible, perhaps even likely, that some of the tenacious crime-related problems often found in areas with lead exposure issues may in some way be tied back to that lead exposure. Now, I want to be super clear that fields of research like crime are broad and deep and complicated to begin with, but if you start to look into the reasons that people commit crimes, it increases the number of possible causes and catalysts almost infinitely. If you steal a candy bar from a store, are you doing it because you're hungry and will starve without it? What infrastructural variables led to that hunger? Or maybe you're doing it for the thrill because you don't see any reason that you shouldn't. Maybe the consequences or the perceived consequences are not substantial enough to make you discount those risks. Maybe you're doing it because everyone else does, or because no one else does and you feel that you are different. Maybe you don't know why you do it, but you feel somehow compelled to do this and other things. You feel compelled to break rules in general. There are micro and macro levels to all these potential rationales, and if you step back and look at each level, you'll find a wide array of infrastructural issues, and societal issues, and hereditary issues, and familial issues, and cultural and pop cultural issues, and economic issues, health issues, and countless other issues that make it impossible, at least for now, to track anything so broad back to just one thing. It's important to recognize that even though these studies add weight to the idea that lead exposure can be a cause of antisocial behavior, it's one of many possible causes, and it may be far from the most important one. It may even be completely unimportant or irrelevant in many or in most cases. On the other hand, it could be the smoking gun. We simply can't know 
with the information we currently have available. That said, the idea that an environmental factor like exposure to a pipe made of a certain material or paint made in a certain decade or the residue of chemicals that were banned a generation ago could influence our behavior is an interesting pathway into the debate between criminality as a choice and criminality as a disease. The way we treat criminals in most cases is as human beings who have made a choice to break the law. They've decided to steal or assault or rape or kill, and as a result, we lock them up or we fine them or we make them perform community service or in some cases, we execute them. They are, in essence, being treated as rational beings who have acted rationally, and their rational choices just turned out to be antisocial and illegal. Therefore, they should be removed from society and punished in such a way that the rational choice next time for them and for others, will be more likely to act in a pro-social way. These punishments are meant to alleviate the immediate problem, but also to incentivize adherence to the law in the future. On the other hand, we often have different standards for this, when it can be demonstrated that someone committing a criminal act is doing so irrationally, either because of some outside influence that has garbled their thinking, or because of an internal issue, like schizophrenia, or some other mental condition that keeps them from being fully aware of the consequences of their actions. What came to be known as the Twinkie defense was an infamous legal argument made by the legal team defending Dan White, a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, who murdered San Francisco Mayor George Muscone and San Francisco Supervisor Harvey Milk back in 1978. The defense was predicated on Mr. White having been depressed and under the influence of that depression. And among other evidence for this state of mind were his massively irregular eating habits, which included consuming almost exclusively very sugary foods, which was a contrast to his normal diet. The story in the press later came to imply that Twinkies were a key component of his new depression diet, and that the sugar was the cause, not an effect, of his depression. Now, both of these suppositions are false, but they make for great stories. The Twinkie defense was meant to demonstrate that Mr. White suffered from diminished capacity, meaning that he was not himself. His full intellect was not functioning. And for legal defense purposes, this also implies that he had diminished responsibility. Now, diminished responsibility is a claim that is accepted in some jurisdictions and dismissed in others within the U.S. In some cases, it's acceptable only when A murder committed by someone with so-called diminished capacity can then be downgraded to manslaughter, meaning the defendant killed someone, but it was kind of an accident, not something done with full rational criminal intent. And that, by the way, was the case with Dan White. He got off on manslaughter rather than murder. In other cases, though, the concept is discounted, and the court decides that, fully mentally stable or not, they did something wrong and should be punished to the fullest extent of the law. In still other cases, the court might decide that not only is the diminished capacity defense legit, but so is the broader and less frequently accepted defense of irresistible impulse, meaning there may not have been any depression or similar mental variations going on, but the defendant simply could not keep herself from doing what she did, which itself indicated some kind of reduced cognitive function. This was the defense used in the infamous Lorena Bobbitt case in 1994, where Miss Bobbitt was found not guilty of cutting off her husband's penis because of her defense's case that the assault was an irresistible impulse. She could not control herself. She had to do it. Interestingly, one of the tests used by some courts to determine if the irresistible impulse defense is legit is called the policeman at the elbow test which says, basically, that if the defendant would still have committed their illegal act if a policeman was standing right there next to them, and they were aware of that policeman, then the chances were pretty good that the act was, in fact, irresistible in some way. They were aware of the consequences that they would face if they were caught, and they knew they would be caught, but they did it anyway, which implies some kind of mental situation, even if there's no more specific title put on it than impulse. So all that in mind, 
what might happen if we were to accumulate enough evidence to support the theory that our environments are contributing to, or even instigating, some of the criminal acts that end up in court? If the minds of these criminals, if their actions are being somehow altered by their environments, by situations that are beyond their control, would the punishments doled out for theft or assault still make sense? How about for rape? How about for murder? At what point would we have to start looking at people affected by things like lead in their environment as victims as well as victimizers? Might we be forced to change the way we legislate, lest we start letting everyone off the hook due to the potential of some chemical or element in their systems that they couldn't possibly be responsible for coming into contact with as a rational choice? Might all antisocial behaviors and criminal minds be conveniently dismissed as products of some outside force? and therefore not punishable, or perhaps less punishable, under our existing legal structures? Let me put that another way. If alcoholism is a disease, if not a literal one, like the flu or HIV, an analogy of a disease, in that it's the consequence of a combination of issues that can predispose a person to have trouble with certain aspects of their lives, and therefore their behavior is not something that's totally under their control, even if they can perhaps regulate the effects of it in their lives in some way. If that's true, couldn't we say the same of petty theft? Could you not apply that same logic to people who steal candy bars from convenience stores? Couldn't you apply the Twinkie defense to people who grow up with lead in their environment and therefore give them reduced sentences or send them to rehab rather than prison? The variables seem to be similar, and the arguments used seem to apply in both cases pretty well. The consequences of the conditions in question, if you choose to accept that they are conditions, are different, but so are the consequences of catching different diseases, and even different strains of the same virus. The flu doesn't look like HIV, and public intoxication doesn't look like stealing a candy bar. But that doesn't imply that these things are not in some way correlated, in that they require treatment. One of the arguments against this perspective is that we should look at the crime committed, not the circumstances underlying the crime, to determine the proper punishment. How much harm was done, that should determine the sentence, the punishment, not whether or not the defendant intended to cause harm. But if this was the code to which we strictly adhered, white-collar criminals, those who collapse economies and steal other people's retirement funds to line their own pockets, would be put away for life, if not executed. The harm they cause is by almost every metric massively more devastating than the harm caused by someone who steals a candy bar. And yet, white-collar criminals often get away with it or get slaps on the wrist compared to the punishments faced by someone who has maybe stolen a few candy bars or committed other acts of petty theft. Similarly, a person who is caught in possession of recreational drugs often faces far harsher sentences than someone who runs Ponzi schemes though the latter is arguably causing far more and far wider spread harm than someone who is doing something that's illegal, but harming no one but themselves if you choose to look at the use of such drugs as self-harm. A big part of why some of these disparities in punishment exist is the result of who has the power to help make the laws that in turn designate who is punished for what. Possessing marijuana in some parts of the U.S. can result in far harsher punishments than operating a complex tax fraud scheme. This is in part because those who run tax fraud schemes understand how the system works, and they play well within the system, they in some cases help shape the system, and they know how to grease the wheels in their favor, while the casual user or dealer of marijuana probably doesn't. There's also no doubt a racial element at play here and a prejudice against lower economic demographics of all races as well. We are far more comfortable as a culture here in the U.S. punishing the impoverished than punishing the wealthy. We also tend to be more comfortable punishing the socially invisible than the well-connected and camera-friendly. It's sometimes difficult drawing a straight line between how some of these punishments operate and racism and classism, but assuming that no bias of that kind exists within the system seems, to me anyway, to be somewhat willfully blind. There's just a whole lot of evidence that points in that direction. It's an interesting thought experiment 
to wonder what it might look like if we applied the same arguments used to get certain types of people off the hook after committing a crime to other people from other layers of the social hierarchy. Consider the case of Ethan Couch. Couch was drugged up and drunk while driving on a restricted license in Burleson, Texas, back in 2013, when he collided with a group of people who were pulled over and assisting another driver whose car had stopped. Four people were killed and nine were injured when he plowed into this group of people. Two people who were in Couch's truck were seriously injured, and one of them suffered complete paralysis. Relative to the consequences of his crime, the people who suffered as a result of what he did, Couch got a slap on the wrist. He was sentenced to 10 years probation and therapy after his attorneys successfully argued that he was not a bad person. He merely suffered from affluenza, a portmanteau word of affluence and influenza, a term that has been used since the 1950s as a criticism of conspicuous consumerism and which they used, in this case, to describe Couch's inability to understand the consequences of his actions because he'd grown up in a bubble of financial privilege, meaning, basically, he grew up rich and wanted for nothing, and as a result, he could not understand why he shouldn't do whatever he wanted whenever he wanted. So the argument was that he didn't even know that what he was doing was wrong. The consequences of his actions may have been bad, but he himself was not a bad person. He was acting in accordance with what he knew, and therefore shouldn't be punished as a malicious individual. Now, Couch later fled his Texas suburb home with his mother, and was eventually detained at a resort in Mexico, before being sent back to the U.S. to serve two years in prison for violating his probation. It's probably safe to say, whether or not Ethan Couch is a serious criminal in the eyes of the law, he is definitely a major douchebag. But this case is interesting because, again, it shows that the law is just as often concerned about the intention and thinking, or inability to think, of the criminal as it is the crime, at least in practice. And if we were to apply that same ideology to other cases, including those coming from other sides of the track, from Ethan Couch, we might end up with far more people in therapy and on probation than in prisons. Because while Couch was brought up in a situation in which he may not understand the consequences of his actions, because he's always had whatever he wanted, other people, especially those growing up impoverished in social situations in which one must take what they can get, even if what they're taking isn't legally theirs, it only makes sense that these petty thieves should be treated as products of their environment, not horrible people. The idea that you don't take something when you can get it, when you can get away with taking it, might not make any sense to somebody growing up in that type of environment. And as such, it would seem prudent to teach them that a more socially acceptable behavior would be to not take stuff that isn't yours, just as the court ruled that the prudent act would be to teach Couch that his actions have consequences, even if his parents clearly never taught him that. This approach to punishment would also take into account things like lead exposure at an early age. Someone growing up with the neurological consequences of lead exposure potentially suffers from, among other things, impulse control disorder, which is identified by the fifth edition of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders as, quote, characterized by problems in emotional and behavioral self-control, impulsivity, a failure to resist temptation, even if their urges may result in harm to themselves or others, end quote. Impulse control disorder is often associated with substance disorders, behavioral addictions, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, conduct disorder, and several different types of mood disorder. So if we were to balance the books and apply the Ethan Couch standard more thoroughly and widely, Allowing one's circumstances and potential inability to control their actions influence our legal judgments. A huge portion of the crime and violence committed, especially in lower-income areas, where there's a greater prevalence of factors that can result in impulse control disorder, including, but not limited to, lead exposure, abuse, exposure to violent situations at a young age, and possibly even low-level background disruptions like living near highways and train tracks. That could do away with a huge amount of traditionally punishable criminality. Taken to an extreme, though, 
would this logic excuse a serial killer who went on a murder spree, but murdered people as part of a compulsion she had trouble controlling? What about a man who gets drunk and gets super emotional and kills his wife? Or a university student who rapes a classmate because he just couldn't control himself? Or a cop who guns down unarmed suspects because of jitters that he gets when he's in stressful situations as a result of PTSD? It's difficult to imagine what the world would look like if we just decided to treat everyone instead of imprisoning anyone. But that's probably what would be required were we to take this concept to its logical conclusion. Everyone, all of us, are consequences of our genetics, our backgrounds, our upbringings, random things that happen to us throughout our lives, the things we eat, the substances we take, and a billion other variables that we would very likely have trouble identifying, much less measuring. It's a nice thought that we might be able to reach in and correct for these antisocial behaviors that result from some of the ingredients that make us people, but it's difficult to know where the line would be drawn. At what point we'd have to say, wow, yeah, it sucks that you lived that life that made you think that way, but you just keep killing people and that's not okay. We have to remove you from society if society is going to continue operating. It's worth mentioning, too, that there is kind of a dismissiveness implied when we assume benign intent with crimes rather than rational malicious intent. We might see someone who is victimizing others and kindly attempt to cure him, assuming he's only acting upon his upbringing and that he can't possibly control the impulse he feels to commit such crimes. But maybe from his perspective, the act was incredibly rational. He's acting to get revenge. He's committing a crime to make a point or right a perceived wrong. And by ignoring the action that he has taken, we are condescending to portions of society by ignoring that there is perhaps a big flaw in society that we should address or a big flaw in the way that we designate criminality. This person maybe is not destined to act criminally in the sense of having a compulsion or a disease, but rather, he is acting completely rationally based on factors he has faced and his perception of those factors. It's a situation that he did not choose to be in, but he was in it nonetheless. And then because of the legal structures we have and the definitions of criminality that we have, we label what he does as wrong, even though to him it's not something that is wrong. And at some point, that should be reflected in the law. A lot of the ways we address these issues seem to ignore that possibility, but also to ignore the serious consequences that emerge from big, difficult problems that we don't want to face in general. We might say that this guy committed a crime because he's the culmination of his experiences, while completely ignoring that his experiences are based on growing up within a very specific legal framework and in a downtrodden area that was left behind by its government and its system of funding infrastructure and was toxified by lax regulations that were allowed to be so lax because of the way that we deal with businesses. Simply acknowledging these flaws can be incredibly difficult, and doing something about them even more so. Our structures are set up in such a way that we are incentivized to talk about the things for which we have solutions, and to set aside those for which no solutions are yet evident. We knew about lead toxicity back when we started using it, but we set it aside because a viable and politically acceptable alternative was not available. We only started addressing that massive issue when we had alternatives and solutions and the political and financial will to make it happen. Up until we reach that point with any problem, the people in charge may feel it would do no good to even try to deal with these issues or bring them up and allow them to weigh down on their reputations as a failure. So they keep such things tucked away maybe to be addressed by a future administration or a future generation. I'm not completely sold on any of the extremes that I'm aware of when it comes to this discussion. The hardcore enforcement based on the impact of crimes rather than taking intent into consideration, or on the other hand, the complete retirement of the concept of crime judged separately from the variables, the potentially treatable variables that influenced them. I personally think that there's a whole lot wrong with our current system of punishment and assessment of crimes, and a whole lot of that has to do with misaligned incentives and, in some cases, corrupt people in positions of power. But in terms of what might change as a result of this line of thinking, of considering lead 
and other potential environmental variabilities and criminality. I do think it's worth coming up with plans to alleviate these issues as soon as humanly possible, so that the consequences can be measured, and we can get a better idea of how at least some of these environmental factors might be messing with our conception of sick and criminal, and so that we all have as close to an equal starting point as possible, so that our choices are more frequently safely assumed to be rational ones. Let's Know Things is a listener-supported show, which means it is brought to you by you. If you go to letsknowthings.com slash contribute, you'll find a list of different ways that you can help support the show if you are enjoying what you hear. Among them is contributing monetarily via Venmo and PayPal. You can become a patron on Patreon if you go to patreon.com slash letsknowthings. But it's also very helpful non-monetarily if you leave a review up on iTunes, if you share the show with a friend, you share it on your social network of choice. All of these contributions are very much appreciated. Thank you so very much to everyone who has already contributed in some way. And thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors. Everlane is my favorite clothing company by far. They make minimal, simple, aesthetically pleasing, goes with everything type of clothing that is anti fast fashion. The idea is that you buy something from them and it lasts you a good long time. And they also make my favorite travel bag right now, the Weekender duffel bag, which is just lovely and has been a pleasure to travel with for the last couple of years. I certainly wouldn't encourage anyone to buy anything they don't need, but if there is currently a hole in your wardrobe that you need to fill, consider popping over and checking them out. And if you go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, then I will receive a commission for anything that you buy over there. So it's a great way to kill two birds with one stone and to get some excellent clothing or a great bag while also helping to support this podcast. Letsnotethings.com slash Everlane. And the other sponsor today is Linda. Linda is an online learning library. It is a huge stash of a bunch of different video tutorials, essentially, on various topics. The normal monthly cost of Linda is something like $20 or $30, which is very reasonable for an unlimited number of views of whatever different classes you want to take. So if you're particularly ambitious, you can get a whole lot for that money. But you can also give Linda a try. If you go to letsnotethings.com slash Linda, L-Y-N-D-A, you'll get a free month free. And so that's a free month. If you end up signing up and becoming a subscriber to Linda, that is financially beneficial to the show. But I think this is a useful service either way, one that I definitely use and enjoy using. So I hope you enjoy it either way if you give it a shot. Letsnotethings.com slash Linda. The book that I want to recommend today is an old book. I read this book, gosh, probably over a decade ago, back when I was working at an indie bookstore in high school. It's a really well-known series, actually, and I'm kind of more recommending the series. And the series of books are by David Bren, and it's called The Uplift Universe, I think, is usually the title applied to the series, though it's kind of two trilogies, The Uplift Universe, and then the second one I think they call The Uplift Series. The first book in the series is Sundiver, and the first three books, including this one, were written in the 80s, and then the second three were written in the 90s. But you can tell it's good science fiction when you can't really tell when it was written. The technology is not dated. They are not talking about the social networks or the computers of the era in which it was written. It's out of time enough that it's still a very, very good story without all those clunky references that kind of pull you out of it. And the concept of this series is essentially that the universe is filled with different alien species. But these species kind of go around and uplift each other. They find pre-sapient animals, animals that are not conscious in the way that humans are conscious yet. And then they use their technology and genetic engineering and selective breeding to make them conscious, to select for consciousness. And then those species become client species of their patron species for something like 100,000 years before they go off on their own. It's kind of like raising a child. You raise these client species. Well, humans somehow were not included in this party. And when we start to meet aliens, we realize that we never had patrons. We weren't raised by another species that was part of this larger galactic community. 
And so we're kind of outcasts, but at this time in human history, which is, I believe, a few hundred years from modern day, we've already started to do uplifting of our own. We have brought chimpanzees and dolphins into sapiens. And so we're not the only intelligent species that we know anymore. We're hanging out and working alongside chimps and dolphins. And so we kind of take on this patron status, that of kind of an elder, well-respected alien race. And that pisses off everybody, pretty much, because we are technologically well behind all of these other aliens, and we're coming into a very big political situation that we don't get. And so we have this weird outsider status that probably gives us more credit than we deserve, but we also were not raised on the same collection of information and technology that every other civilization that we know of within the galaxy was raised on. So that gives us kind of an asymmetric advantage as well. And so each book is a different story set in a slightly different time, set within that universe. And it's got different characters and it's got different heroes and villains, but it's an excellent read the entire series all the way through. There were parts that I had definitely forgotten and am very much enjoying now through the eyes of a different version of myself from when I was a teenager and reading these things. But David Brin, he's very thoughtful in the topics that he addresses through his fiction. So I'm guessing that if you give it a shot, you will enjoy it. Again, the first book of this series is Sun Diver, and the series itself is called The Uplift Universe. You can find out more about me and the work that I do at colin.io. You can find my blog at xllifestyle.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of this show at letsknowthings.com. While there, consider signing up for the Let's Know Things newsletter, which is actually less a newsletter and more just a collection of links to interesting things that goes out every Monday. You can also feel free to reach out and say hello on pretty much every social network at Colin is my name. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week.